Cody. So our speaker today is Dr. Edward Kennedy from Annette Mano University. He is currently an associate professor of statistics and data science data. He received his PhD in biostatistics from the University of Pennsylvania, co-advised by Dennis Small and Marshall Jock in 2016. Um, Dr. Edward Kennedy, Kennedy's research mainly focuses on causal inference machine learning on parametric statistics with application to political sciences and uh, medical sciences. Uh, he has received many awards, including NHS Career Award, David Biley Young Investigator Award, Thomas Young, Thomas Tempab Award, among many others. So today he is going to talk about the optimal estimation of um, heterogeneous effects. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the nice intro. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about some recent work uh, about minimax rates for heterogeneous effect estimation. So I'll give you the punchline here at the start. Um, so if you fall asleep, the, the rest of the talk uh, won't matter. Um, all right, so there have been all kinds of proposals recently looking at um, methods for estimating treat, uh, heterogeneous treatment effects. So this is how causal effects vary across people, vary across feature information. Um, if you look at archive, you'll see lots and lots of uh, papers being submitted on this, on this topic with lots of interesting methods. Um, but there are some really uh, crucial theoretical gaps. So there uh, is a lot that's unknown about how we should benchmark these methods. Um, uh, this is especially true when, when these heterogeneous effects have some interesting structure to exploit, some non-trivial structure, things like smoothness or sparsity, um, right? And so some natural questions are, you know, one, how are all the methods that people are proposing, how are they working? Are they good methods or, or not? Um, can they be improved? You know, to what extent can we improve them? Uh, and in general, what's the best possible error we could hope to achieve in this problem? Um, when can we know that we've found sort of an optimal method and we can stop trying to uh, iterate? So this is what we're going to try and uh, figure out in this in this work. And uh, along the way, I'm going to tell you about three different estimators. Um, and there's sort of a hierarchy in these estimators that they, they sort of move from being more general to more specialized to a particular models to understand how, how they work in, in a particular setting. Um, but in general, the, the kind of takeaway is that uh, they're flexible and they give uh, some nice error guarantees relative to what, what, what you see in the literature. Uh, and then the second part of the talk, the last part of the talk, I'll resolve this question of optimality um, from a minimax perspective. And so answer this question of what's the best possible error we can hope to achieve in this problem and how do we construct estimators that actually achieve this optimal error. So that's the whole idea. Um, okay, so uh, I'll first give some motivation for why we care about heterogeneous causal effects. Um, from sort of a high-level perspective. Um, so it's it's very common in causal inference problems and policy problems in general to look at effects of treatments or policies at a population level. So maybe the classic causal inference parameter that people first start with in any analysis is usually an average treatment effect. It says, what would happen if I treated everyone in some population uh, versus if I treated no one in some population? What would, what would happen to the mean outcome in these two worlds? Uh, but of course, means can obscure important heterogeneity, stuff that's going on sort of under the hood. Um, so one, you know, uh, simple but extreme example would be where maybe uh, a treatment or a policy has zero effect on average, uh, but it might be that it just harms half the population and it benefits the other half. And so looking at the mean would just obscure this, uh, this story. So why should we care about heterogeneity? Uh, there are a lot of reasons. Um, one first thing that people often think about is uh, is about designing optimal treatment uh, or policy rules. Uh, so one reason we we would want to look at how people, uh, you know, specific kinds of people respond to treatment, is because if we can if we know who's uh, benefiting from treatment, who's being harmed, we would just give treatment to the people that benefit. Uh, this is one natural reason why we should try to estimate how effects vary across uh, uh, feature information. Um, but this isn't the only reason. You might also just want to understand, uh, you know, improve your understanding of the variation in, in effects in, in a problem. Um, it might help you to uh, design new treatments. If you can figure out who's uh, not responding to a treatment, you might try to devise a new one to, to uh, you know, help improve outcomes for these people. And so this comes up across lots of different fields in medicine, social science, 
So I'll give you a couple examples that you can use to have in mind throughout the talk. Um, here's one from COVID. So th these are the three uh, main experiments that, um, that came out uh, looking at the, the three main uh, COVID vaccines, uh, all in the New England Journal. Um, and so all of these papers have some results like this, where uh, the vaccine efficacy uh, is studied across subgroups of different kinds of patients, right? And this is really useful to understand in this problem. We would want to know if there, uh, you know, different kinds of patients are responding differently to the vaccines, or if not, that's also useful to know because then we could make blanket recommendations that the vaccines are, are effective. Um, in this case, this is uh, Moderna, uh, I think. Um, so here, there's not a lot of uh, heterogeneity in, in the response to the vaccine which in some sense is a good thing. It's effective across all these different subgroups. Um, here's another kind of result like this from uh, one of these other papers. Uh, here, uh, looking at, again, vaccine efficacy across different kinds of populations. Um, in this case, it's maybe more diverse populations across different regions uh, in the world and uh, looking at different, um, uh, uh, different outcomes as well. And here you see a lot more heterogeneity in the vaccine efficacy. Um, you know, ranging somewhere from say 50-ish percent to uh, you know 80 percent, and so here there might be some some uh, reason to try and understand what's going on. This was from a later study, and so you might expect that the um, you know COVID has sort of adapted maybe to to the vaccine in some sense. Um, so that's one example. Another example is from political science. This is a plot of voter turnout rates uh, in the U.S. for presidential elections and midterm elections over time. And the main takeaway is that it's pretty low. Uh, you know, it's roughly around 50%, a little bit higher for presidential elections, it's lower for midterm elections. So there's this big effort to try and improve voter turnout. Um, it's uh, a little bit distressing, right? Because the, the people that vote are uh, typically different from the people that don't vote. This is some threat to, uh, you know, representative democracy maybe, um, right? So there are a lot of efforts to try and improve turnout. Uh, here's a summary of uh, some of the, the different strategies people use to improve voter turnout. Um, and some summary of their effect across different experiments. Um, so if you look at things like face-to-face -face canvassing, this is sort of like a gold standard um, approach to improving turnout. You go and talk to people and remind them about an upcoming election. Um, uh, and so here, this effect uh, is something like 8% in this, in this uh, survey. This requires a fair amount of resources. You have to get people and actually go you know, talk to people physically, uh, go knock on their door. Um, and roughly what you see is as you uh, look at strategies that um, are less intensive, uh, you see less and less of an effect, as you might expect. So things like, um, you know, uh, putting, sending out leaflets or sending mail or uh, at the other extreme robocalls and, and emails have essentially no effect on average. Um, but you might think that some of these uh, uh, strategies might have different kinds of effects across different kinds of people, right? Some people are more or less responsive to emails. Um, and so there's a paper by Koska and I and Aaron Strauss where they um, looked at, at this, this kind of problem with uh, classification regression, regression trees and found some important heterogeneity across uh, things like age, for example, which you might expect. Okay, and this is useful in these, in these cases. If you're uh, a campaigner, for example, you have limited resources. You can't maybe spend all of your resources on canvassing. So you might try to just canvass the people that are most likely to respond to that canvassing and maybe find people who are uh, you know, likely to respond to some of these other strategies, which are less, uh, less expensive and, and spend some resources there. Okay, so those are, those are a couple examples to, to keep in mind. Um, now I'll formalize the problem a little bit uh, in, uh, and talk about uh, what happens. So we're going to think about this kind of classic causal inference data structure where we see uh, covariates or features X or D-dimensional. Uh, we'll think about things uh, in some generic uh, setting, and then we'll kind of specialize later. Uh, we also have treatment information uh, A, which we'll think of as being binary or discrete, and an outcome Y. So in the get out the vote kind of example from political science, the features might be things like what city you live in, uh, what party you're affiliated with, your past voting history, some demographic information. The treatment might be whether you were actually contacted uh, by a canvasser, and then the outcome would be whether you ended up voting in some upcoming election or not. Okay. And so in causal inference, uh, we want to understand effects of, of treatments. We can't just look at observational data and, and look at associations and call it a day. So we have to define exactly 
these effects that we're interested in. And a natural way to do this is with counterfactual notation. So why superscript A is a special uh, counterfactual variable that we don't get to see directly. And it tells us uh, what the outcome would have been under a given treatment level, little a. And so why one, for example, would be whether I would have voted uh, if I was actually contacted by a canvasser and spoken to and reminded of an upcoming election. Y0 would be whether I ended up voting, uh, if not, if I was never contacted. Right. So in the observed data, we don't get to see these Y1s and Y0s for everyone. At best, if I'm actually canvassed, you get to see my Y1. You get to see my outcome if I was treated, uh, but you don't get to see my Y0. That's hidden from you. So this is sort of like a missing data problem. Um, so what which would we be uh, estimating here. So the average treatment effect is this quantity I mentioned earlier. It's sort of the classic causal inference parameter. It's the starting point for lots of different causal inference analyses. This says, what would the mean outcome be in a world where everyone's treated? So it's the mean of Y1 compared to the mean uh, outcome if, uh, if no one is treated, so the mean of Y0. Okay, so there are lots of ways you could uh, quantify heterogeneous effects, lots of ways you could uh, you know, drill down and understand how uh, treatment is, is affecting uh, more, you know, finely defined uh, subgroups of people. But the classic way to do this is with uh, what's called the CATE, the conditional ATE. So instead of just looking at the effect of treatment on this different scale on average, you do this within levels of covariate information X. And so you, instead of looking at an average of Y1 minus Y0, you look at a regression of Y1 minus Y0 on X. And this tells you, again, uh, this is a, now, you know, a curve in, in X, for example. This tells you how the treatment effect varies across this feature information X. Okay, so uh, this is still a somewhat mystical quantity, right? We have information on X, A, and Y, but we don't get to see Y1s and Y0s directly. So this is what we hope to estimate. We need to find some way to link this to the observed data that we actually have. This is a common um, uh, issue in causal inference. Uh, and so we need some extra structure to be able to estimate this quantity from, from observed data. We're going to use some standard known measured confounding assumptions, which I'm not going to go into detail about. But essentially, if we assume that all the X's we've measured are uh, all the relevant confounders in the sense that they render treatment essentially uh, randomized, they make it independent of potential outcomes, then this conditional average treatment effect uh, can actually be written as a difference in regression functions. So each regression function, the regression of the outcome Y on covariate X among the treated group, this under these assumptions actually equals the, a regression of the potential outcome Y1 on the, on the features. So you can just look at the treated people and do a regression of Y and X to estimate this counterfactual uh, regression curve. And then the difference is just a difference in two regressions. So it's a regression of Y on X among the treated minus a regression of Y on X among the controls. Right, so this is the statistical representation of this causal quantity, just a simple difference in regression functions. This is what we want to try and estimate. Um, one of the things I really like about this problem is that it's a very simple um, quantity. It's a really simple estimate. Um, it also comes up in non-causal problems, right? If you just have two groups, uh, a data set with two groups, and you want to understand whether the regression in one group is different from the regression in another group, you would also try to estimate something like this. Um, it feels like a quantity that we would have a good handle on. We know a lot about non-parametric regression in statistics. Uh, we have a good understanding of this across decades of, of work. Uh, but it turns out that by taking a difference between two regressions, you completely change this problem. You sort of turn it on its head, and, and there are all kinds of interesting nuances that come up. Um, OK, but this is going to be the focus of all this work, just trying to estimate a difference in two regression functions. Very simple. OK, so how should we estimate this thing? The first thing you would think of probably is you would say, OK, I, I want to estimate the difference in two regression functions. I'll just estimate a regression function in one group. Uh, you know, maybe I'll run random forest or something on y on x, and then I'll run another regression in the, in the other group, and I'll take a difference. So I'll get predicted values at each x and take a difference. Um, right? So this is just like sticking hats on the definition of this uh, difference in regression functions. I'll call this a plug-in estimator. So it's very simple, uh, the first thing you would think about. But in general, this kind of procedure can be highly suboptimal um, in the sense that its mean squared error can be uh, way too big. It doesn't exploit all the, the data that you actually have to estimate this quantity. Um, so why is this? The main idea is that the complexity of this difference in regression functions can be very different from the complexity of each individual regression function. Uh, 
um, separately. And by using this kind of plug-in approach where you just estimate the two separate regressions, you're going to be hit by the complexity in, in estimating the individual regression functions rather than the difference. And this comes up, uh, this is a real issue in causal inference problems because these individual regression functions, these represent something like how the outcome you know, is associated with covariates in each uh, group. This may be some very complicated uh, you know, biological process, for example. Um, but the difference is representing the effect of the treatment. This could be very simple uh, in many cases. It might be constant, uh, it might be zero if you're studying an ineffective treatment, but in general it might be far less complex than each of these individual sort of natural outcome progression functions. And so in general, uh, this uh, difference has to be, for example, at least as smooth or sparse as the individual regressions, but it could be much more smooth or sparse uh, in general. And so we want to try and find a way to make sure we exploit this extra structure when it exists. And if it doesn't, uh, then that's fine too. Hopefully we won't lose anything. So here's a, this is really the main idea in, in a lot of this work. Um, this is the main reason why this problem is different from regression. Um, so this is a, a key point. I'll try and drive this a bit home with a toy example. <clears throat> so here's uh, an example of regression function. Uh, so on the x-axis, we just have x, and on the y-axis, we have the true regression function. I'm going to simulate some data from this regression curve. Um, the thing to note about this regression function is that it's uh, somewhat complex. It's going to be hard to estimate. It has a, a jump, a discontinuity. Um, it's, it has a, a kink, right? Uh, and it's going to be somewhat challenging to estimate statistically. Um, but in this case, I'm going to simulate data where this is going to be the regression function both for treated individuals and for control in individuals. And so the difference between the regressions is just a straight line. It's just zero. And we're going to see what happens with a simple kind of plug-in estimator. So here's some data uh, generated centered at this, this regression function. And the blue lines are treated individuals. The red lines are control individuals. And so you could do this naive kind of plug-in approach where you just fit two regressions to each of these two groups, the treated group and the control group. Um, in this case, I just did this using smoothing splines and R with all the default tuning parameter values. And so we get two curves, and they're both pretty complex because this regression function, each individual regression function is hard to estimate. Right? We're going to have to pick a you know, relatively small bandwidth parameter to try and capture these jumps, for example. Uh, it's it's going to be a hard regression problem to estimate these things individually. And so here's a plot of what happens when you take a difference. You might expect you get another very complex uh, estimate. You get something that has lots of jumps and wiggles, when in reality, it should be a straight line right at zero. Right? Question, yeah? Uh, it seems like uh, what you have more points here and more Yeah, that's a great question. So that's representing uh, confounding. So in this example, people who have higher Xs are more likely to be treated. Uh, people who have smaller Xs are more likely to be controls. Um, and so in causal inference, this would be like saying the treated people are maybe taking treatment, you know, for some particular reason. They look different on average than the controlled people. Yeah, it's a good question. So in this example, the no unmeasured confounding, like that condition is being added No, in this example, there's no unmeasured confounding. All the confounding is explained by the X variable, which we have access to. But there's confounding by measured variables. Yeah. Yeah, great question. I meant to say at the start, feel free to stop me at any point if there are any questions at all. Yeah, thanks. So this is just a toy example to show that even in some very simple setting with a simple regression function, some simple confounding, uh, using this plug-in approach can give you uh, a very complex estimator when in reality we should be hoping to get something that's like a straight line. Um, this is a more general phenomenon. This is just a, an example to help us think about these things. Um, okay, so what should we do here? How can we improve on this plug-in sort of approach? Um, how can we exploit any you know, potential structure in the difference in the regression functions that we might miss by just looking at the individual regression functions? I think a good uh, heuristic to use in these problems is to think about what we do uh, in, in the causal in inference world when we estimate average treatment effects. Um, and intuitively, the, this conditional um, uh, uh, average treatment effect Right? It's really like an average treatment effect in some small bin of the, the data. So we can think about it as like a localized version of an average treatment effect. And we could try to adapt methods that we use and, and know and love from the average treatment effect setting to, to the setting. Um, so in, for estimating average treatment effects, this is a problem that's 
pretty well studied. There are still lots of open problems, even for the simplest causal inference problem of estimating an average treatment effect. But uh, we know a fair amount here. And uh, one thing we know, for example, is that there are these doubly robust style methods, um, which essentially construct some kind of pseudo outcome. Um, I'll tell you more about it in just a minute, uh, and then average it. Um, so one natural first thing you might think about doing is, okay, for an average treatment effect, I take this, this doubly, robust, uh, doubly robust kind of quantity and I average it. So maybe for a conditional average treatment effect, I'll take the same exact thing and regress it on covariance instead of averaging it. And so this leads to a, um, a very natural kind of estimator in this setting, which uh, has some, some history. The first place I ever saw it proposed is in 2005 in this paper by Mark Vanderland. Um, people have rediscovered it over and over again over the past two decades. Um, so I'll tell you what this procedure is, and then I'm gonna uh, give some analysis of it for you. Um, so first, uh, we need to estimate some nuisance functions. Uh, so in causal inference, this, this always happens. In this case, we need to estimate propensity scores, which I'm gonna call pi. This is your chance of being treated given covariates. So you just regress a treatment indicator on covariate uh, values. We also need to estimate these two individual regression functions, the mu1 and mu0, the regression function among the treated and the regression function among the controls. Um, we're going to do some sample splitting uh, so that we can make some uh, strong guarantees about how this uh, procedure works without imposing strong assumptions. Um, so we're going to use half our sample to estimate these quantities. And you can use uh, this procedure I'm going to tell you about is a very black box sort of meta learner style procedure where you can use any methods you like. And in the analysis, we're also going to be quite agnostic about how you actually, uh, you know, if you like linear regression, you can plug in linear regression here. If you like random forest deep learning, you can use that. And we're still going to give some guarantees that that hold. Um, okay, so we construct these uh, nuisance estimates. And then we go to a second part of the sample. Um, and we construct this pseudo outcome, which essentially looks like the plug-in estimator in that red uh, piece there. You can see, yeah. This is just like the plug-in estimator where you take a difference in these regression fits. And then you add some inverse weighted, inverse propensity score weighted residual term in blue. This is exactly the, the object that you construct when you're using these doubly robust style estimators, which go by lots of different names. Uh, double machine learning uses exactly the same kind of thing. Um, but now we're just going to, instead of average it, we're going to regress it on covariates in the second part of the sample. This is a very simple procedure. You do the same step you would do when estimating an average treatment effect. You just run a regression at the end of the day. Um, and so I'm going to denote this second stage regression but with this e hat n given x notation. So again, I'm going to try and make uh, give you some guarantees about this procedure without uh, having to specify exactly what methods you use when you estimate the propensity score and regression functions or when you do the second stage regression. I want to be agnostic about this so that we can give some general guarantee. Um, so that's the estimator. And here's just a picture. We take our data set, we split it into two. There are variants where you can split it into multiple folds, more than two folds, um, and do a cross splitting thing. Um, the analysis is, is going to be essentially the same. Uh, so in part of our sample, we estimate the, this propensity score. So we run a regression of treatment on covariates, and we estimate these regression functions. And we construct this pseudo outcome, this uh, plug-in piece, plus an inverse probability weighted uh, residual. And then we regress that on covariates in the second part of our sample. So that's the procedure. Quite simple. And the only difference from the average treatment effect case is just that in that second part of the sample, we don't average, we regress. Okay, so here's uh, the sort of result you can, you can prove about this procedure. Um, so all I'm going to assume is that the, um, the estimators I'm using are consistent at any rate, uh, and that the second stage regression procedure satisfies a stability condition. Um, the stability condition I'm not going to talk about in detail. I want to get to the minimax stuff. If people have questions, I'm happy to, to talk about it. Um, in, in the paper, uh, we show that it holds for um, uh, linear smoothers, which is a big class of regression procedures. But it's an open problem uh, whether it holds for other kinds of procedures. I expect it does, but I haven't, I haven't shown that. Um, OK, so here we can think about an oracle estimator which uh, you can either think of as regressing the true pseudo outcome on covariates or in the causal inference setting, regressing the true potential outcomes y1 minus y0 on x. This will be sort of our benchmark for now, and then we're going to come up with another benchmark uh, a bit later. So this thing has some mean squared error. This Oracle procedure has some mean squared error. And intuitively, we're not going to be able to do better than this ever. 
right? If I actually gave you the potential outcomes and regressed them on covariates, there's no way you're going to be able to do better that when, when you don't even see the, the potential outcomes. Um, so this, this uh, oracle mean squared error is going to be our, our benchmark. And so this DR learner procedure um, satisfies this kind of decomposition. So the, the estimator minus the oracle, right? So we want this to be small. If this is small, then we can say that this procedure behaves essentially as if we were regressing the true potential outcomes on covariates. Um, right? So it, it has some, uh, some error, which is the main piece here, uh, which I'll explain to you in just a minute, and then some lower order term, which is lower order than this oracle mean squared error. So this, uh, this bias term here, which is the, the whole driver, if we can say that this thing is small, then we can say that the, this procedure is going to be asymptotically equivalent to the oracle. <clears throat> this bias looks like a product of biases and, or a product of errors in, in uh, propensity score estimation and regression estimation. So this is sort of a, a conditional average treatment effect version of the double robust style results that you see for estimating average treatment effects. Um, where you get something that has an error that looks like a product of, of uh, propensity score, estimation error, and regression error. And this product is what uh, really buys you everything. This is where this double robustness and double machine learning, all the double uh, terminology comes in, because we have a, a product of errors. So even if one of these is modest, as long as the other one is modest or small, the, whole, the product will be even smaller order. Uh, and we can, for example, estimate these guys, which are complex in general, these are complicated regression functions, we can estimate these at relatively slower rates and still get faster rates for the thing we actually care about, the, the Kate in this case, um, because we, we're multiplying these two errors together. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, result you see here. Um, and uh, yeah, the nice things about this, it's essentially model free. It doesn't require you to specify anything about the first stage estimators. The second stage one has to uh, satisfy some stability, which is quite mild. Um, and we get this nice double robust kind of error result. Um, right? Again, this is saying what I just said. We get faster rates for estimating the thing we care about relative to this, these nuisance quantities, which are typically going to be harder to estimate. Yeah. Is the data splitting completed or just used to get Is it uh, causally related? Is the data splitting procedure is it, uh, no, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think there are some open questions related to this, um, but it really is is crucial, I think, to, to be able to be completely agnostic about the estimators you use for the propensity score and the regression function. If you don't use that da uh, data splitting, I think you'll have to um, kind of open these black boxes and, and say something specific about what, what these things are doing, because if they're overly complex, when you don't uh, data split, you can get some bias from overfitting, basically. Um, you're sort of using the data twice. You're using it once to estimate these regression functions and another time to estimate this like conditional expectation. And um, so yeah, this data splitting, I think, is really necessary for being completely agnostic about these, uh, these things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in practice, I've seen I've seen both cases. I've seen settings where the data splitting really improves the the procedure in terms of like empirical error. I've also seen cases where it doesn't really do anything at all. Um, and I, yeah, I think there's some really fun open problems trying to figure out when exactly is it uh, necessary to split data and um, uh, like how much. Uh, condition, you know, how much structure do you really need if you're not splitting? Um, typically, classically, what people did was use empirical process conditions like Don square conditions, um, which restrict the complexity of these regression functions. There have been some interesting papers recently that say you don't need these Don square conditions. You can uh, use some stability conditions. But I think it will be impossible to use the data twice and be completely agnostic about the the regression function. So I think it is buying you something, but yeah, exactly how much you need and, and when exactly you need to start putting down structure is an open question in some sense. Yeah. So just to ask, like one half of the data, but you can also reward the loads as well, switch, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and the analysis is, is exactly the same. And so the, yeah, in practice, what I always do is cross fitting because then you get the full sample size efficiency um, uh, rather than like an n over two kind of uh, efficiency.
Okay, um, so this, uh, this procedure is very general. It's very uh, black boxy, which I think is, is good in some sense. Um, you know, you can plug in whatever regression methods you like here uh, and use it. In practice, I think it's a very uh, stable procedure. You know, it's sort of a regression analog of the usual doubly robust thing. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so now we're going to start sort of specializing a little bit, and we're going to say what happens in this classic non-parametric uh, function space where the functions have some smoothness. Um, so we're going to work with these uh, holder classes, which you can think of as essentially saying that these functions have up to, say, s minus 1 bounded derivatives, and then the highest order is which is continuous. Um, so this is the kind of, yeah, classic uh, function class people use in non-parametrics. Uh, the smoother a function is, the easier it is to estimate. The less smooth it is, the harder it is to estimate. So we're going to try and understand what happens with this estimator in this smooth function class. Um, we're going to start to specialize. The previous result didn't require any kind of smoothness or any, any structure at all. Um, but now we're going to say what happens in this classic non-parametric uh, class. And then we're going to try and figure out the best possible uh, error in this class as well. Um, so this previous theorem that I showed is... Um, the generality of it is, is useful because now when you have, you know, for example, a particular function class, you can just plug in the, the rates that you get uh, under this uh, function class and, and get a, a result. So I'll show you what that looks like. So for example, in the smooth case, we could say that the propensity score has its own smoothness, alpha. So it has alpha minus one bounded derivatives. Uh, we know the optimal rate for estimating alpha smooth functions. It looks like n the minus one over two plus d over alpha. So it's something like a root in parametric rate with some penalty paid for how big the dimension is relative to the smoothness. So the more smoothness, the easier it is, the closer we get to the classic root in rate, the less smoothness, the, the further away we get. And then these individual regressions, they'll have their own smoothness. They'll be beta smooth. So we know the rate we can estimate these guys at. And then the Kate itself, the difference in the regression functions also has its own smoothness, gamma. And, and this gamma has to be at least beta. So the difference between the regression functions has to be at least as smooth as the individual regression functions, but it can be much smoother in general. And then the rate we get uh, from this DR learner procedure looks like this. So we get a rate, again, which represents like an oracle rate. This is the rate we would get if, if I actually gave you the potential outcomes and you regress them on covariates. Then you get just the, the gamma smooth uh, rate here. And then we get a product of errors from estimating the propensity score and the regression function. And so now you can back out, for example, you know, how much smoothness do I need in the propensity score and the regression function to be able to make this term smaller order and just get back to this oracle rate here. In this case, it's some condition on the uh, square root of alpha times beta. So here's a picture of what this rate looks like. Uh, I'm gonna come back to this picture a bit uh, in the talk. So on the x-axis here, we have the average smoothness of the nuisance functions of the propensity score and the regression function. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the mean squared error. Okay, so the more smoothness we have, the easier it should be to estimate the conditional effect. The less smoothness, the harder it is. When you have no smoothness at all, you're not gonna be able to get non-trivial rates. So here's this Oracle benchmark. This is the rate we would get if we actually observe the potential outcomes and regress them on covariates. In this case, it doesn't depend on the nuisance smoothness because this is in this pretend world where we actually see the potential outcomes. Right? It doesn't, we don't have to estimate any propensity scores or anything. This is the rate you would give the plug-in estimator. It's pretty far away from this Oracle. Um, and it's just achieving the rate for the regression function by itself. Right? And so the only way that this plug-in estimator in general would match the oracle rate is when there's just no extra smoothness in the difference in the Kate, right? And, and then the rate for estimating the difference, the conditional effect, is just the same as estimating the individual regressions. So only in this you know, far extreme case out here where there's just no extra smoothness at all um, does this match the oracle rate. In general, we could do much better um, when, when the Kate has its own smoothness that might be higher than the individual uh, regression functions. So here's the rate you get from that DR learner result. And so this thing matches this Oracle rate for some amount of uh, smoothness in the, in the nuisance functions. And then, you know, has some smooth decay uh, as you'd expect. So right, again, less smoothness, it's harder to estimate. We shouldn't expect to get non-trivial rates. Okay. So now, now the question is, um, 
what's the best possible performance we could have achieved here? Could we have done better than this DR learner procedure? Um, you know, this is a very natural thing to do, take the usual doubly robust thing and regress it instead of average it. Um, it's very simple, maybe we could do better, maybe there's some structure we could, we could exploit to get better rates. Uh, you know, we'll never be able to do better than this oracle, but maybe we'll be able to hit the oracle rate at some lower amount of smoothness, um, for example. And so that's the question motivating this work. And, and the whole point here is to try and get some benchmark for thinking about whether all these proposals for estimating heterogeneous uh, effects uh, quantities are, are optimal, how, how good they are. Can we improve them? Yeah. So what, what is the line? Yeah, this is actually the minimax rate. It's the optimal rate for estimating the average treatment effect. Yeah, so that one's not really relevant, which is why I, I didn't really mention it. I just put it there for reference. Um, this is one of the few parameters in causal inference where we have some version of the minimax story figured out for the average treatment effect. But um, yeah, part of part of this talk is just a also uh, maybe a call for more people to work on these minimax problems in causal inference because I think there are tons of open problems, lots of cool things to to figure out. But yeah, this is this is for the average treatment effect. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we've got this very general estimator. We know it hits this optimal oracle rate at some point, and now we want to figure out if we can improve it. Could we have done better? Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to got about what, 15 minutes. I'm going to be quick and tell you about the second estimator, and then I'll go to the minimax story. Um, so this is all from this paper from 2020. Uh, in the first half of the paper, I analyzed this DR learner procedure. In the second half, I propose a different estimator uh, based on what's called an R learner. And I'm going to skip over the details. But the main trick here is that we open the black box uh, of the propensity score and regression estimators under the hood. The R learner is also some kind of doubly robust style estimator, which looks a little different, but, but not too different. Um, the way I improve, uh, I get faster rates actually than the DR learner is by um, estimating the, the propensity score and the regression function in a way that's specialized for estimating the conditional effect. Um, and so I do this using under smoothing. This is also a classic tool that has been used for estimating kind of regular parameters like uh, average treatment effects. Um, so the intuition is that you estimate the propensity score and the regression function in a suboptimal way for estimating those objects themselves, but in a way that helps you estimate the downstream thing of, uh, that you actually care about, which in this case is the conditional average effect. And so the way to do this here is to estimate these with too little bias and too much variance. And so I wouldn't use cross-validation, for example, here. I would uh, push down a bandwidth parameter so that I'm estimating this thing with very small bias, the propensity score, say, or the regression function with very small bias and, and variance that's too large. Right? So I'm getting a suboptimal mean squared error for estimating the propensity score. But then when I do the second stage regression, I'm averaging out some of this extra variance so that I can make it so that this doesn't actually hurt you in the end and you just get a benefit from the smaller bias. So this is the whole idea in the second procedure. I'm gonna skip the details and just show you the picture. Um, so you get a faster rate and here's what it looks like. Here's the plugin estimator. Here's that DR learner procedure. And this is this under smooth R learner procedure. It's another doubly robust style estimator with this under smoothing trick built in. So in this case, we attain the oracle rate uh, under a weaker condition on the smoothness uh, of the nuisance functions. And then again, you get some decay. But now, again, I've just shown you an estimator that uh, I, can sh I can prove you know, uh, does better than this DR learner in, a, in the smooth function class setting. But again, we have a question of, you know, could I have been more clever and figured out some other estimator that would have done better than this? Um, and uh, right, I, I didn't rest easy at night for a long time because I constantly worried about this. So this brings us to minimax rates, right? So could we have done better than this? Could we have improved this thing? So how do we say, uh, you know, how do we think about optimality in this context? We can't use classic notions of semi-parametric efficiency because we're in this non root and rate problem. We're in a non-parametric regression style problem. So a natural way to think about optimality here is through minimax rates, right? So this is saying, what's the, the worst case risk in terms of this mean absolute error, for example? across all distributions I'm thinking about, which for us are gonna be like smooth uh, functions. So what's the worst case uh, risk? And then what's the estimator that does the best? So what's, uh, what estimator minimizes this worst case uh, risk across all possible estimators, all possible functions of the data? 
So these minimax rates are they're really well understood in lots of areas in statistics, um, but not very well understood in causal inference. Um, and I think, yeah, again, there are lots of fun problems to work on in this context, but they're really useful. Um, so for example, we saw minimax rates for smooth non-parametric regression before. So these look like n to the minus one over two plus d over s. You know, this is nice. It characterizes uh, how difficult this problem is, and it shows us that it depends on how big the dimension is relative to, this, to the smoothness. It shows us how this, the decay uh, away from the parametric rate uh, works in this function class. Um, for functional estimation or parameter estimation, you get a rate which is faster. You get n to the minus one over one plus d over four s. This is uh, giving us a way to formally uh, you know, quantify the sense in which estimating a parameter is actually easier than estimating a function or a curve, uh, which is uh, interesting. In sparse linear regression, you get rates under some conditions that look like root s log d over n. So this tells us you, know, you almost get the you know, sparsity level uh, acting as, as the dimension, but you pay a log price for, for the large, larger uh, dimension of the problem. Uh, in density estimation with measurement error in a non-parametric model, you get log, log in rates, which are very slow. And so this is a way of telling us that this problem is really hard uh, unless we add some extra structure, right? Um, so again, it's useful to know. It tells you uh, if a problem is just inherently hard and, and, and maybe you need to uh, reconsider the model, um, or if you, know, you get a faster minimax rate and you see that estimators are not attaining that rate, then you know that the estimators need to be improved. So this has some really important uh, implications, I think both practically and theoretically. Um, practically, it gives us a benchmark for the best possible performance, right? So we don't have to keep iterating and coming up with clever methods and, and you know, just sort of wander in the dark and wonder about whether they're good or optimal or not. We can actually analyze them and compare them to this uh, optimal rate. And we know that if they attain the rate, then we couldn't have done better. Um, Right? We can sort of rest easy at night. Uh, if they don't attain the rate, then maybe we need to improve our analysis or construct a new estimator. Uh, and from a theoretical standpoint, it's very interesting because it really uh, illustrates the fundamental limits of you know, estimation and whatever the problem is that you're looking at. It tells us something about the inherent statistical difficulty of, of the, the problem you're considering. Um, okay, so the main idea in deriving these minimax lower bounds um, is as follows. So you construct uh, two distributions, say, um, that are very similar. And they're so similar that you could not distinguish samples from them. So if you saw samples from both, you wouldn't be able to sell them apart uh, reliably. But you construct these in a clever way so that the thing you actually care about estimating is actually separated under these two distributions. So you get some difference in the parameter you actually care about. And then the logic is that uh, this tells us that no estimator could actually do better than whatever that separation is. Um, because if, if it did, then you would actually be able to reliably test between the distributions. This is the idea behind uh, these lower bound constructions. So we have to come up with some interesting kind of special case distributions and show that they're close uh, overall, but separated in terms of the quantity we actually care about estimating. And it turns out for nonlinear functionals, you can't just pick two distributions. You have to pick lots of distributions and put a mixture over them. Um, and so we need to use these, these kinds of tools in our uh, Minimax lower bound construction. Okay, so again, the ingredients are you need a pair of mixture distributions, which again, you have to sort of think about, uh, you know, what are distributions where I can ensure that in our case, the Kate is separated, you know, it looks different under one distribution than the other, uh, but overall the distributions look very similar uh, to each other. And we wanna make their distance between the infold products uh, uh, very small. So this is just saying that the, the distributions have to, have to be close uh, overall, so we couldn't reliably uh, distinguish them. Um, okay, so here's a, a lemma from the Sibikov uh, 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 book is, is really useful if you're curious about learning more about NANX rates. Um, this is just saying if the Hellinger distance between uh, these two uh, mixture distributions is small so that we can't reliably distinguish them and the parameter is separated, then you get a finite sample lower bound on the minimax rate. So we, we know that the minimax rate uh, cannot be smaller than something that looks like a product of the separation and the distance, basically. So now the idea is to come up with these two uh, uh, mixture distributions, which are, are close. Um, and uh, the way you do this in these smooth function classes is by uh, carefully putting little bumps in places. Um, and so I'll tell you about the way we, we do it uh, in this paper. And the main 
uh, main idea is we're going to combine um, minimax lower bound constructions for non-parametric regression and for parameter estimation. Um, I'll tell you more about that in just a second. So we're going to stick a little bump on the Kate on the difference between the regression functions under one distribution. And then we're going to bin this uh, within the area of this bump, and we're going to put a bunch of little bumps on the propensity scores and the regression functions, and these bumps are either going to go up or down. Um, and we're going to put a mixture over, whether the, over the direction of these bumps, whether they go up or down. Okay, so the, yeah, the main intuition here is it's, this is combining the uh, lower bound construction for non-parametric regression, which really just puts one bump on a regression function and compares that to uh, a straight line. And then the lower bound construction for functional estimation, which bends the whole uh, support and then puts a bunch of these bumps going up or down and puts a mixture over the direction. Um, so there are some nice papers by J.B. Robbins here and, and Bridget Massart where they do this for other, uh, other functionals. This paper by Jamie is the only uh, paper I know of where uh, people have looked at minimax rates for causal effects. So here's a picture of what this looks like. Here's the Kate under one of these mixture distributions. We just stick a bump uh, at some point x0 here. And then we create a bunch of bins within this bump. And then here's the uh, regression function uh, under this distribution. And we put a bunch of little bumps on each of these bins going up or down. And uh, we put a mixture over, again, the direction. And then the propensity score will be a straight line here for one distribution. So that's one distribution. Now for the other distribution, we're going to not put a bump on the Kate. We're going to put a straight line. We're, again, going to bin this local uh, uh, region near x0. And now we're going to put bumps on both the regression function and the propensity score. And essentially, what we're going to do is sort of very carefully control the size of these bumps so that uh, having put the, um, the bumps on the propensity score on, on one of these distributions and not the other, and then the bump on the Kate on the other allows us to make these distributions look very uh, close. Uh, even though the Kate is separated by this this bump. Um, okay, so in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to give you the main result. Um, so after you come up with this construction, you just have to carefully control the size of these bumps, and you have to bound the distance between these distributions to ensure that it's small enough. Uh, and then you get this minimax rate from that lemma from Sibikov. Okay, so the model here we're thinking about is uh, there are some conditions on the covariate density, which I'm not going to worry about. The propensity score is alpha smooth, the alpha minus one bounded derivatives, uh, mu zero, the regression function under control. So each of the individual regression functions are, are beta smooth. The Kate is gamma smooth, and we're thinking the Kate could, could potentially be quite a bit smoother than the uh, individual nuisance things. Then the minimax rate looks like this. So there are two regimes, which people call an elbow phenomenon. There's one regime where you get the oracle rate. So it's just the rate if you saw the potential outcomes and regressed them on X. And then apart from that, you get this different rate here in the minus one over one plus D over two gamma plus D over four S. And this rate is actually uh, quite interesting. So the main thing about this rate <clears throat> is it's very clearly a mixture of non-parametric regression rates and parameter, uh, parameter estimation rates. So non-parametric re uh, regression rates scale with D over two gamma. Uh, that oracle rate for estimating the Kate scales with D over two gamma. Parameter estimation rates scale with D over 4S. And so this minimax rate for the Kate scales by the sum of these things. So the, the main result here is this is telling us that the Kate is really this weird hybrid object. It, it behaves something like a regression function, but also something like a parameter, something like an average treatment effect. And uh, depending on how smooth the Kate is, it, it's at one of these two extremes. So in, the, in one extreme where the Kate is very smooth, it behaves essentially like an average treatment effect. At another extreme where the Kate has no extra smoothness, then this problem is just like as hard as a non-parametric regression. But there's this really interesting intermediate space in between these two extremes where this thing is, is behaving like some weird hybrid quantity. Um, and there are lots of quantities that come up uh, in causal inference that, that have this sort of hybrid nature. Uh, lots of open problems to think about here. Here's a picture of the rate. Um, so you get some elbow phenomenon. At some point, there's the, the um, oracle rate's going to be achievable, and it depends on how smooth the Kate is, and then otherwise you get some, some decay. Um, so I'll just finish by saying we also give an estimator in the paper which attains this minimax lower bound. So uh, we can actually construct something that uh, is optimal. Uh, the estimator is complicated, and it's apparently not very practically feasible. So this is another open problem to, to work on, trying to make this actually usable. Um, 
And I will just finish here with uh, the estimator itself looks like some uh, localized use statistic. Um, it's a little bit messy. It has a couple of tuning parameters. The main, the main reason why it's not very uh, practically feasible is because the, we don't have a good way to pick the tuning parameters. So I'll just show you the rate here. Here's the plugin rate. Here's the DR learner rate. Here's the 